So uh, let's come, uh, and Jeannie, if you want to start recording. We did, okay. Um, so we're back into S40. Committee, you'll see there's a, uh, there's a new version of S40. And it's paper clipped to your folder. I don't think we'll, um, we'll look at that new language um, just yet because we've got, uh, tomorrow we've got Michael Grady scheduled and he'll walk us through what he did. But I'm, I'm sure it's pretty easily understandable, but we'll, we'll wait for him to explain it. So why don't we start with Jeff Fannin. Hey, Jeff. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> it is somewhere. I did sleep. <laughs> this is icy. It's safer than bed. Uh, good, good afternoon. Jeff Fannin from on EA. Uh, here to speak with you about S40. My comments are rather brief. Um, I was just talking with uh, Jay before. Uh, my members simply drink the water and teach the kids who drink the water. And uh, we support the notion of having that water tested to make sure that it's uh, lead free and that if it is, does contain levels of lead, that there be proper remediation and a plan to do so. And uh, that's, that's really it, so we support the bill. I do think that if there is uh, testing, there will be expenses associated with testing and re remediation, that if they do have that, that schools should not have to, um, two, two things come to mind, they shouldn't have to have that count towards their educational spending uh, as well as it shouldn't count towards the excess spending penalty if they do. It should be subtracted out so that they're not penalized for spending money that we all think is well and good socially that, that kids and people don't drink lead, but they shouldn't be required to pay for it or be penalized, if you will. We've, we've talked, uh, and, and I've talked individually with the pro tem and the chair of appropriations, and the intention is to cover matching expenses, state, local district. Um, so with that, probably most, I take the point about excess spending, but I'm thinking it would probably be a small price tag with that matching. Certainly if you're, the appropriations uh, are there to cover it, yes, but the excess spending penalty, so we, we don't want to penalize people or tax people Fair additionally enough. for work that we've asked them to do. Yeah. Even if it's only $2,000. It's something. Things. Right, there's an additional cost every dollar over the excess yeah. spending penalty. So okay. we ought not to do that. Um, what's your thought on parts per billion? I am not uh, a water expert. I know that yeah. there are some folks here in the, in the room here who are certainly better equipped to answer that. So I think uh, the experts should be asked and, and that should be responded to. I am not, and my members, I'm sure there are some science teachers in my ranks that could answer that question better than I could. Yeah. I am not equipped. To Qualified, so I don't want to okay. opine. So strong support for Absolutely. mandatory testing quickly as possible. Fair to say. Well, I think you know, within reason, I think schools ought to be given some time to figure out how to do it. I'm not sure. Somebody asked me about the testing. I was talking about the natural pass, and asked about testing capacity in the state. I don't know the answer to that, and, and so somebody else again might have that answer. But certainly, schools shouldn't be penalized if they can't find a, a testing facility to do the testing in a re yeah. in requisite um, amount of time. I think the commissioner yesterday was pretty clear that testing ability is there and they're confident they can get it. That's great. Then I think that they should be asked to test in a reasonable time and, and, uh, and move ahead with a remediation plan if necessary in, in a reasonable time too. Yeah. Uh, so those are my brief, rather short comments. Happy to take any questions, but. Questions for Jeff? Okay. Thank you all. Least controversial testimony you've ever given. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> no, I'll count on that going forward, too. Um, okay, so Jeff Francis. So uh, let me introduce Jeff. I don't believe you've met Jeff Francis yet. Nope. Some um, have. When we talk about the usual suspects, Jeff is the most usual of those suspects. We hear from him a lot because of his uh, extensive knowledge of the system. And in this case, um, you're speaking for superintendents, school boards, and principals? Yes, today? yes. Um, and I'll explain all of that. Uh, before we get into the testimony on S40, I brought you each your own copy of the Vermont Education Directory, oh, which is useful information about the school systems in Vermont and their organization. Um, it's compliments of the 
principals and superintendents association. If I could, let me tell you how you use this. So you get an invitation to go to one of your districts, take this, put this um, in your glove compartment, and then right before you go in, you read all the statistics and uh, everything about it, and you walk in and you just seem like you have an encyclopedic knowledge. That's just how I use it also. <laughs> I also have printed copies of the testimony that I'm gonna deliver. Um, and before I start formally, let me just say it's a pleasure to be here. I'm gonna, I'll talk about um, the bill in a fair amount of detail, um, including the funding aspect, which I'm sure you'll have questions for me about because we're, we're taking a position somewhat different than that was that was articulated by the school uh, by the Vermont NEA. So um, I'll read this because I think it's the quickest way to do it, and then try to be prompt and answer any questions. So, as Senator. Sir Baruth indicated its testimony offered on behalf of the Superintendents Association, the School Boards Association, and the Principals Association. Those three associations have a fair amount of experience working on environmental health issues in schools. We have experience with working with the Department of Health, AOE, and the Department of Environmental Conservation on the pilot that was run on lead. Um, we also uh, were involved at some level on the PFAS testing and pilot. Um, and I'll touch back on those themes as I go through the testimony. Um, we decided that it was most efficient to deliver the testimony um, as a collaborative. We're operating from a core set of principles that are reflective of our collective thinking, particularly with respect to this issue of testing water in schools for lead. I always stress, um, and this is by design point number one, that we are committed to supporting safe and healthy learning environments and education settings when they're funded in whole or in part by taxpayer dollars. This includes Vermont public schools as well as private and independent institutions. So the inclusion of independent schools and um, child care settings is an important part of the bill that we support. We also think that um, both the state and the local school districts our right to recognize the commitment and public investment in achieving safe learning environments. We um, want to stress the absolute necessity of close and careful coordination between and among state agencies. In this case, it's the Health Department, the Department of Environmental Conservation, and the Agency of Education. I think that to the extent that we have observed glitches in past environmental health program, it's because the department and agencies didn't always work as closely as they might have. Um, and we have a particular interest in an understanding on their parts of how schools function. And I'm going to come back to that. Um, we think that the state agencies um, have to pay particularly close attention to how schools function. That's the point I just made. Um, we also believe that in this case, um, and I know that you're going to have questions about this, we think that the remediation and testing should be paid for by the state. And I'm gonna talk a little bit later about the Ed Fund and fiscal implications for individual school districts. Um, the pace of Jeff, the, yes. Yeah. Sorry, when you say remediation and testing, you mean 100% or both? I'll, uh, I, we, we're asking for 100%. I'll explain why, and you can judge for yourselves whether you think there's logic to the, to the request. <clears throat> we think that the most efficient and expedient method for getting the work done is to streamline the process by simplifying the funding and payment models. I'll elaborate on that. <clears throat> Um, you asked Jeff Fannin what he felt or what Vermont NEA thought about um, parts per million of contaminants. Um, we've looked at that, um, and it's not fair to say that we've studied the research, but we've looked at the research. We know that um, pediatricians, for example, look at actionable levels at anything one or above. We know that the EPA um, cites 15 parts per million, billion. Um, our organizations are interested in that issue. We're less interested in it if the state funds the entire program. I think that you need to err on the side of safety, but we know that the, um, the research and the science 
is not always consistent. There's no reference in S40 to a comparative risk analysis. So when you look at the age of the buildings and so on and so forth, I think some folks would argue that the parts per billion standard could be reflective of a comparative risk. That science that we're content to leave to the health department and DEC, I think that it's an important consideration when you take a look at what the ultimate cost of the program may be. I'm not gonna, I, we are not gonna weigh in on that. We have an interest in that. I think we'll have more of an interest if you say that you want cost sharing from schools because we're gonna then be put in a position of having to evaluate the costs. I, I believe that's the likeliest outcome. 100% state coverage for testing, right. 50% uh, matching for Sure, so I'll, I'll respond to that specifically. Um, so with regard to S40 specifically, we've got our points enumerated here. We support the purpose of the bill as written. We support the inclusion of child care facilities. We reserve comment on the proposed action level of um, levels of contamination that require action. Um, uh, we believe that the um, testing, as you indicated, should be paid for entirely by the state, including um, follow-up testing. Um, there's a provision in the bill that requires schools to keep records with regard to um, the results of the test and mitigation. We think that a far more appropriate and efficient manner would be for the state to establish a central database. These records are too important to be retained, certainly at the school level. At a minimum, they ought to be at the district or supervisory union level. But we think if this is an important public health initiative of the state, then there ought to be a repository for the information and have it maintained at the state. One of the rationales for our um, proposal there is that while schools are adept at keeping records, there's a lot of turnover. If this is a health initiative with environmental conservation interests, then there ought to just be a repository where the results of the test and the remediation action get put to a central database and that it gets managed from a central database. The new Secretary of Education, Dan French, is a technologist by nature. He's talking a lot about data and utilization of data, retention of data. We ought to start right now with this type of a program and put it all in a single um, repository. Um, there's a drafting um, matter in the bill that I want to point out to you. I'm not exactly sure what the remedy is, but Jim Demare could help if you um, accept the logic of my thinking here. So if you take a look at the definition section of the bill, it refers to schools and incorporates both public school buildings and independent school buildings and intentionality there. Um, but if you talk with um, school officials, their common vernacular does not regard a school as a um, entity for purposes of deliberating action, following through on action, and taking action. So it's, if you took a look at the Montpelier School District, for example, they have Main Street Middle School, Union Elementary School, and Montpelier High School. The notion that the school itself would take action is not consistent with how the public schools operate in the state. The locus of control is the school district, mm -hmm. and the reference in the bill should be the school districts taking action. Remediation plan, notification, testing, it ought to be school district in the schools within that school district, not the school themselves. Yeah. Um, if you look at um, the section on actionable level notice and reporting, we think that there's an important admission, which is the Vermont Agency of Education. In fact, draft one of the bill, and I haven't seen the second draft, doesn't make any um, reference to the Agency of Education whatsoever. Because the Agency of Education has um, authority for oversight of public schools and public education in Vermont, an initiative this important should not move forward without um, involvement of the AOE. And the reason is because if I have an issue around, um, if an issue, not if I have an issue, if an issue comes to my attention involving a school, almost in any um, uh, aspect, my first point of contact is generally the agency of education. So even though it's an environmental health issue, 
the AOE understands better than DEC and health how schools function and operate, and they should be party to the entire bill um, in an Can appropriate I just manner. Unpack that a little bit. Yep. Um, so when you say party to, I'm hoping you're not talking about dual regulation. No, no, no. So you're talking about. Um, uh, so one, you're talking about AOE having the information on their on their website, right? But uh, can you say a little bit? Yeah. So one of the final recommendations we make goes to the rulemaking process itself. We think that it should be explicit in the bill that in the process of making these rules, mm -hmm. that health and DEC should consult with um, the educational organizations because we think we're gonna be able to inform the rulemaking process in terms of what makes sense. I'm gonna give you an example, and this is not intended to disparage any party. We were working on the pilot for um, testing for lead in schools, mm -hmm. and I went to a meeting with representatives of all the named entities, and they were talking about going into the school buildings and doing tests either the last week of June or the first week of July. So that's indicative of the fact that they did not understand how some schools operate because right. schools have a tendency to close down in those months and you'd be hard pressed to, in some cases, find anybody in those schools. So when we start thinking about what school personnel we might employ to draw the water samples or who's gonna receive the test results, you, you know, if you lived in Burlington your context would be different than, than if you were associated with the, um, the Washington Northeast Supervisory Union or the Champlain Valley School District or, so, or so Addison that's, Central. That's easy enough. We can, we can um, make reference to that in the, in the rulemaking section. You're not talking about anything beyond that, um, you know, in terms of oversight or authority or I think that if the if the <coughs> oversight and authority gets treated the way we believe it should for a for a program which is has the high priority like this one does I think we'll be okay um, where you run into trouble is if somebody in a local school district has a question that they need an immediate response to and they're not clear whether to call the health department, the Department of Environmental Conservation. I don't think they should call the Agency of Education, but if they don't get a good response or any response from those two other two entities, then it ought to be somebody at the AOE that they call and say, I'm trying to get an answer to this question and I can't. Yeah. Um, because you can put somebody out into the, um, the uh, organization that is state government that doesn't have any familiarity with that particular entity or organization, and they're gonna to wanna to go to a more familiar place, and that more familiar place, if, it, if it's not them calling me, they would be calling the AOE. Um, so I, you know, I would say that these are pragmatic recommendations that are offered as soft recommendations because I didn't know what the subsequent version of the bills would look like. I didn't go to the letter of the particular legislation. Mm -hmm. These are concepts that we will be looking at subsequent drafts to see if they get incorporated or not. Yeah. And if somebody says to me, how do you want that incorporated, we'd have a conversation about that and try to get it incorporated if you're so inclined. Well, what I, what I will do, I'm, I'm making notes here. I'll pass this on to Michael Grady, who's been drafting for us, and have him uh, work up language for, we'll have a little discussion at the end of the test okay. and see, uh, Okay. And, and so we will do our best to maybe not speak to every one of you. Sure, the, okay. The majority. I'm now on point number eight on the second page. So um, that, that simply suggests that if there's gonna be a website <clears throat> at the Agency of Natural Resources that um, is uh, informative with regard to the testing results for schools, then we simply think there ought to be a link to the AOE because we think in some instances parents and families would first go to the AOE in terms of trying to find out about the circumstances or conditions for a particular school. So, uh, schools do a lot of work with families to ensure that they go to the website to get information and so this is another category of information that we think ought to exist at that website. Um, under number nine, we talk about the lead remediation response. 
we don't we can't emphasize um, enough that um, that the initiative ought to be properly resourced both with regard to funding and personnel so we just want to make sure and I, and I say this with um, uh, a fair a fair amount of understanding and appreciation for the work of both a and r and the department of health we want to make sure that the folks there know what they're dealing with as it were um, and I, i'm confident that they will be but we feel it's an important point to reiterate um, number 10 talks to the reference in the um, in the bill to the model plan um, and this may be uh, simply a matter of interpretation of language. One definition of plan would be you receive your test results and then create a plan to respond to the results of that test. Um, and that's a valid way to describe it. I think that for um, an initiative which, which is going to result in various forms of remediation, like plumbing fixtures or piping or water source, rather than talk about a plan, it might rather than have a model plan, it might have might be explicit steps to resolve a particular finding. So rather than a plan, like a practical approach, you, you five bubblers. Here's the method that you use to replace those drinking fountains. I oh, guess I dated myself for that. No. <laughs> um, I, it may not be. That's why I qualify the statement but that says this may be a matter of interpretation. Well, the, way, the way I think about it is I'm a parent. I find out that my kid's school has lead in it. I want to know what's going to be done. They hand me this document. Here's what we're going to do. Yeah. We're going to replace in the north building. We're going to replace these three. In the south building, we're going to replace these two right and it's going to cost the district this much because the state is supplying this much so now i have a, a picture of the work that's yeah. going to be done i i agree with you entirely so okay. may, maybe the use of the word model that threw me off yeah. um okay. I, I was thinking of that and this is to ruth's point yesterday i was thinking of that as you know uh, uh something where you could plug in a template a template yeah, I mean, that would be good. What I'd want to say also is that we know that the average cost per fixture is this. We know that the supply companies that can provide new fixtures is this. We know that the plumbing companies that can do that work okay. replacement. I'm, gonna, I'll, I'm not going to belabor the point, but I'm going to talk about how schools are going to work with this based on my experience. Um, number 11, um, the bill calls for initial testing to be completed by January 1, 2020, but the Agency of Natural Resources is not required to complete rulemaking until November 1, 2020. So you're going to have a lot of action kicked off potentially before the rules are in place. The, the version that Michael Grady advised for us puts in uh, an interim uh, guideline, okay. set, of, set of guidelines. And um, because we had Corey, I think, brought up that exact point. Right. So um, I believe what we're talking about in the current version of the bill is there's a, a kind of emergency action guideline that we're leaning on. Right. With the idea that rulemaking would follow and be done by. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, number 12 talks about the Vermont Agency of Education involvement. They can comment on that for themselves. I'd be redundant if I revisited that. Um, 13, I'm already said, we would like our associations consulted with during the rulemaking process. Um, 14 speaks about uh, the absence of an appropriation. I believe the second version of the bill has an appropriation and I know the governor announced 1.3 in his budget address. I don't know how his approach and your approach are gonna reconcile, but it's good that there are budgetary references. I included 15, um, both uh, as instructive to the committee and because I think it's a valid point. So in 2003, the General Assembly um, passed the law 3 VSA 832B, which basically was intended to point toward the fact that schools are being asked to do more and more. So there's a provision on the books titled Administrative Rules Affecting School Districts which says that any agency um, promulgating rules affecting school districts needs to do a cost-benefit analysis, both of direct and indirect costs. Um, 
I think that the uh, agencies that are doing the rulemaking should be alerted to that requirement, particularly because while the state may test, um, may, may pay for testing and remediation at some level, there's going to be a lot of implications for school districts in terms of the work that they have to do at the school district level itself. I in no way, shape, or manner bring that up because I think that you shouldn't be doing this. On the contrary, I think you should be doing it. I just think that sometimes in the dynamic that involves schools and all forms of initiative in the state, the cumulative cost implications are often lost on people. So you will hear me when I sit in this committee on almost any topic that involves fiscal impacts on schools, talk about the fiscal impacts on schools. So now I'll go to the funding. Um, I, my preference and the preference of our associations would be to have the state fund this as 100%, both mitigation and testing, here's why. There's not gonna be any lack of commitment from school districts in terms of getting this work done. So you don't need schools to signal their, their intent around this by putting up some money themselves. That's the first thing. The second thing is the investment that will need to be made if you expedite this is gonna be off budget cycle. So school districts are developing budgets for the next fiscal year right now. If tests start to materialize at the first of the year and school districts are asked to remediate on a timely basis, you do not want them waiting till July 1 in the next fiscal year. You want them to go to work to take care of it right away. They won't have budgeted for that. That's the second thing. The third thing is the administration of a 50% match, both for the state and the school district, may not do justice to the amount of money that you're going to need in total investment. I think you would be better off to say, we're going to test we're going to have a schedule of remediation costs that we'll fund, not do grant programs, not do applications, simply say, your plan says you're gonna replace five fountains. We know through our research that that's gonna cost X. If you give us invoices that some know more than that, we're gonna pay it. Um, another, uh, so, so, I'd like to have you think just about the administration of a matching program as opposed to an expedited program which has the state pay, which is the state is you know, well versed in that. I'm, I'm confused how it's less administration if we pay all or half. It seems like the same amount of administrative work, it's just the cost shares. Uh, I don't think that's true because of the calculations that have to take place. I mean, there's, it's, there are interactions. <laughs> it's hard to do it. <laughs> well, but let me, let, me also, let me make another point, and I'll ponder that feedback. Um, if you take a look at the pattern of school budget approvals in this state, I can predict with a fair level of certainty some districts that will defeat their budget on the first time through. If you take a look about perceptions of community wealth and how education gets funded, I think that it's within the realm of possibility that you may find school systems that historically are considered to be more financially stressed and strapped than others. So the notion that you would go to any school district and say, and, and I'm gonna pause here and ask that you consider my, my line of reasoning cumulatively rather than piece by piece. If you go to any school district and say, you know, you need to replace these fixtures, the perceptions in those communities is gonna be different from place to place. There are places that will take care of it immediately. Montpelier looked at the fact that this program was coming, and Montpelier, where I reside, has a history of basically supporting any level of expenditure for its schools. They initiated a program on their own. There are other places that I will tell you have their hand to their head right now and they're saying, boy, when they come in and test our schools, if they find five fixtures, that's gonna be a measurable burden and impact on our school. And when you consider the rurality of some of the schools and the declining enrollment and the, and the corresponding increase in ed spending as, in, in, as enrollments dec decline, if, if this is a public health initiative by the state that you wanna take care of on an expedient basis, 
you're, you, you would be far better to grease the skids. And then let's, say that the, let's say that the total cost of remediation, I have no idea what they're gonna be. But let's say it's, it's uh, $5 million. You'd be better off saying the five million is available. We're going to get the job done, then we're going to have to split it. And <clears throat> let me here's let me, take it. Let me yep. take Senator Hardy's question. Uh, I only have one more point, and then I'll well, but I'll take, take it. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. So Jeff, I I appreciate your point about health equity, which is a, an issue that the Commissioner of Health brought up yesterday. Um, that in some of our communities there may be more um, uh, ability and more. Um, Enthusiasm yeah. for doing the work. I completely appreciate that. I think that in a lot of cases, the remediation is not going to be as expensive as you are presenting it. Uh, replacing a few faucets is not going to be an enormous cost for most school districts. And um, the paperwork and bureaucracy for some kind of even 50% match may be more uh, burdensome to the school district than just paying for a $50 new faucet. Um, so I, I, I'm, I don't want to, and, and I said this about the model plan too, I don't want to create bureaucracy that's unnecessary. And um, I think that if, if we have to dig into the pipes and replace a whole bunch of plumbing, then obviously that's going to be more expensive and that might be something that we would want to look into, but uh, with to your point of, of making sure it gets done and not overburdening school districts. Um, but if it's really just replacing a few faucets, it seems to me that creating a bureaucratic structure for that is excessive. And um, maybe we could create some kind of uh, match for cost exceeding a certain amount um, that, sure. we that would be more appropriate than okay, we're gonna give you $25 because you just spent $50 on a faucet. Well, just, just to clarify, so I take Jeff's point about they would like a, a statement of the, the state's willingness to pay what it's gonna pay before the bill leaves this committee. But the plan has always been that the Appropriations Committee will create exactly what we're talking about. So we can obsess about it in here, but Jane and her people are going to do what they do. They may decide, as uh, Ruth is suggesting, that there's a an amount that triggers these grants. They might decide, after looking at it, that you're right. They should pay 100 percent. I tend to think <clears throat> what they're what they're going to do is land on 50-50, and districts will have to apply for that. In which case, it may be that if it's 400 dollars, they might have a fund that would cover that, and they move on without applying for that $200. But um, but I hear your testimony, and I'm, I'm not kicking the can down the road completely, because the statement we make in this bill will have to take a, a stand in one way or the other, but that can be countermanded very easily down the hall. And I, you know, it's, um, I've made my points. I understand your perspective. Uh, I, I don't think it's a showstopper one way or the other. Um, I was on the committee that made decisions about the $5 million in school safety grants that went out. It was an extraordinarily heavy bureaucratic process. So, you know. There you were, you were, it was a competitive process. Well, it was competitive. The governor had in his, in his built, in his, in his um, address today, another $1.5 million, I think, for that. It was competitive to the point that they wanted to make sure that the investments were well made, but there was an effort made to fund the high percentage of those grants as possible. Well, I mean, that's why you had to expend a lot more time. Yeah. Here we'd be talking about, here are our receipts. Yeah. Give us half. Yeah, I, you know, and again, I'm not, I, I don't, it, it may ultimately be worth quibbling over, but not today. Okay. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and another option would be to just have the bills for the fixtures and the, and the replacement go right to the state. Don't even engage the school district at all. But I, but let, I, all I ask is that you think about it. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so that is the sum total. If, with your permission, I'll look to Jay and see if he thinks I left anything out. Is that okay? Yeah, I don't think you left anything out. <clears throat> I just want to touch again on the model plan thing. What we were concerned about was a model plan. The idea of there being a template. Jay, that, I'm sorry. Uh, Jay Nichols, Vermont Principals Association Executive Director. 
when we wrote the legislation together, what we were concerned is oftentimes we see model or model plan. And it comes out with, it's this format that it may not fit certain places. So having some type of template where people could build into it what they needed to, that makes perfect sense to us. Okay. Great. I'll answer any questions if you can <coughs> take any more from me. I, I neglected the most <laughs> important thing about you. He was Joe Benny and Ruben. That's true. Yeah. So think about that every time you see him. Because I can't look at Joe Benny without thinking about it. <laughs> yeah, that's good to know. That's good to know. Yeah. Uh, uh, you're with, all I, with that, I think I should excuse <laughs> myself from the. Uh, one year, from more than one day. I, I've known Joe for a long time. <laughs> but I understand it, one of them was the real troublemaker, and the other one was kind of a goody goody, and you can. Yeah, I mean, figure that out. It wouldn't be appropriate for me to respond without <laughs> Joe, Joe here to hear it. So, thanks very much. Thanks, Joe. So um, that was extraordinarily efficient because we, in effect, heard from all three organizations. Uh, right then. So, uh, Rebecca Ellis, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Environmental Conservation. Thank you. And I am here. Please join me in quiet. Um, so, for the record, Rebecca Ellis, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Environmental Conservation. And uh, Brian Redmond, Director for the Drinking Water and Groundwater Protection Division. And thank you for taking us in at short notice. And um, we had some comments on the proposed Bill S40 Draft 1.1. And I was able to give some of you paper copies, um, but there's more, and I've just emailed it to your committee assistant. And we wanted to comment on some things and yeah. also give you a chance to um, ask us questions as well about some of our positions. Um, and I brought Brian along because he can answer questions. <laughs> um, so basically, six um, comments. We also have a markup of the bill that's more detailed, which I can provide to you or to Michael O'Grady. Um, our first and main comment is that um, we want to make sure that when the bill gets drafted in its final version, that Vermont Department of Health is the lead agency. And um, you did have a draft yesterday that Commissioner Levine brought in that would make the EH the lead. And so part of the reason we're recommending this is because we did do a pilot last year in 2018 with the Department of Health. And one of the reasons we did the pilot was to figure out who's got the best expertise in which areas and to learn some lessons. And we felt that Department of Health really has better connections with the schools. Um, they do testing already. They have a lab. Um, and that it would make sense to have them do that portion of the um, project initiative. DEC really has expertise in terms of remediation. So if your school does have a hit, what do you do to fix it? Um, and water systems can be very complicated. And so that's what our staff does, is help people fix the water systems. So this is something that um, both BDH and DEC agree on. And so we would recommend moving the program into Title 18 and out of Title 10. Um, second, we. Um, recommend that the um, legislation keep our current action level of 15 parts per billion um, instead of lowering it to one part per billion. Um, and that if you keep it at 15 parts per billion and you do a remediation that you then um, have the school um, bring their, their levels of lead down to the lowest feasible level, obviously below 15 parts per billion. But the reason for not going down to one part per billion is that that is not sometimes feasible for a school system. School systems will frequently take water from, you know, outside from a public drinking water system that might be at five parts per billion, and that um, is perfectly legal and that meets federal standards, federal and state standards. So you, if you have the level too low, it's really it's setting up an impossibility for schools. Um, it can also lead to much higher costs of compliance. And that was an interesting discussion that you had about the costs. Um, our experience at the 15 parts per billion is that the remediation involved changing out taps. It was really inexpensive. It was at the $50 level. If you are at a lower level, and again, it's hard to draw exactly where the line is, but if you're at a lower level that's um, uh, below what the public drinking water system is giving to you, that's millions of dollars that you're talking about. So, because you'd have to replace the whole public drinking water system. So, um, I just want to drop in quickly and say that uh, we spoke earlier, Rebecca, and I, I said that our testimony yesterday 
um, to, a, to a person pointed to lower um, action levels than 15, and that the, the science-based testimony seemed to be pointing toward lower levels. Um, I, I said that we hadn't yet decided what we were going to do, but that seemed to me to be the science-based argument. Here you're talking about lowest feasible level, so we're, we're in a different area of considerations in some ways, Feasib feasibility, costs, um, et cetera. So the committee will have to weigh those when we ultimately straw vote the PPP level. Right, certainly. And it is interesting to um, consider how health-based standards are set versus maximum containment levels are set. So you have VDH saying the health-based standard is, you know, I guess it's one or no lead really um, is the best. Um, when the EPA and states set maximum contaminant levels, they try to get it as close as they can to the goal or to the health advisory, but a, um, a maximum contaminant level also looks at feasibility. And so that's why you do consider costs in setting that level. And so I think if this committee does want to lower the action level from 15 to something lower, that it is very appropriate for this committee to look at the cost because the cost will be much higher. And we'd be, we haven't done this yet, but we'd be happy to work with Joint Fiscal Office to give you some estimates of what costs might be as you start going down. Stephanie is preparing a number of different options for us, and I believe part of it was based on child care centers or not, all of the child care centers or not. But I believe we asked, didn't we ask for different parts per billion? I don't think that we did okay. specifically. But we have that information from the pilot, kind of. We have the numbers. We, yeah, we have the numbers from the pilot that yeah. we asked her to look at and sort of, uh, and also mm -hmm. from the testimony that we heard yesterday based on what um, Professor Costanza Robinson found in the schools that she tested right. in terms of per yes. percentages. And that's so I think that Stephanie was going to make an estimate based on those two. Right. That's my recollection. Yeah. And absolutely, any information that you can feed to Stephanie about. Um, estimates and costs would be very helpful to us. Um, I, I just, you know, the, the 15 parts per billion is a, an old um, uh, recommendation from the EPA. Drinking water standards for bottled water are five parts per billion. A health-based standard recommended by the American Pediat Academy of Pediatrics is one. Mm -hmm. If we're going through the entire process of testing every tap in every school in our state, in order to make sure that our kids are healthy. I find it really disappointing that you guys would recommend a standard that's not a health-based standard. And obviously there are feasibility and cost issues at hand, but to start at a level that is not actually based on the health standard is, is, is I think, incredibly problematic. Yeah, and we're certainly talking about the health of our children and our youngest children, so health is the first and foremost concern. Yeah. yeah. Um, so going on to the third point, which some of the members might not find appealing, um, we recommend at this point to remove the requirement for testing at child care facilities and maybe do a year-long pilot or a, um, a study. The pilot that we did in 2018 was schools. It did not include child care facilities. And the reason for doing a pilot is to work out what are the issues and what's the best way to roll out a program, which we think we can now provide for schools. I don't think we have that level of comfort at this point with child care facilities. Um, also, um, many child care facilities are already regulated by the Department of Children's and And the bill says if they're yeah. not already required to test or not already regulated, they then would be, they would fit into here. But, but again, we have an open question there about whether we revise that language in the bill to go to all or mm -hmm. leave it or take it out and put a pilot in. So. Um, model language about a pilot program would be okay. useful for us to see um, when we make that decision. Um, and, you know, as I said before, some of those feasibility questions will be made in appropriations because that's more their bailiwick. This is education and kids in here. So, you know, if push comes to shove, I'm personally leaning toward uh, lower action levels and more testing in daycare centers because 
that's our charge. Um, but we will we'll do our own analysis, but just to say we, we start with a different focus in here. Once it hits the money committees, the focus shifts back to feasibility and numbers and et cetera. Um, we'd be happy to provide some modeling yeah. about a pilot. Um, on the fourth point, I'd like to be minor, just that if there's data or a website, um, we would recommend that's managed by the Department of Health. They would be collecting the data. They would have to test results. Um, you wouldn't have any problem with, I think Jeff uh, Francis was talking about a mirror uh, module on the AOE website. Okay. Right, that would be fine. I mean, they would probably just link to whatever the yep, website is. Like, yeah. Yeah. Um, the fifth comment, it looks like you already noticed that the rule making date was after the when the testing yes. began, so that I thought that was maybe even a typo, so I was going to suggest changing the date back a year, although that's not very much time to do rule making. It sounds like maybe you're going to address this through some other way. That you could also yeah. have a protocol for the first year or That's something what we're like doing. that. Okay. So um, I forget what it is, but it's. I didn't see it in the version that's online. But no, it's. Uh, uh, Testing. Oh, sampling shall be conducted according to the methodology provided for under the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's three T's for reducing lead in drinking water in school. Um, so that's what we're proceeding under before the rulemaking, I believe. OK, and I think um, our comment on that would be, or uh, something like state standards. Uh, some state-specific requirements. There are a few things, uh, features to the pilot that we included that were, are not part of three Ts. Um, that we would recommend implementing. I haven't read through the new, newest version of the bill, but uh, as you heard from uh, Dr. Uh, Stanza Robinson yesterday, yeah. the flush sample at the initial. That, that is three T's. Uh, not at the initial collection. Uh, three oh. T's looks at it um, as, as a feature to um, diagnosing a remediation. We'd rather have that information up front. Um, as part of the initial sampling collection because you're diagnosing the fixture and then further down into the pipe. So yeah. that's a good indication if you need to go back behind the wall and you're yeah. getting into more expensive remediation. Okay, so I'm, I'm a little confused about what you would like to see. Um, so to the extent you could give us um, pieces of language that speak to what you're talking about, um, because Michael Grady is not an expert in this area either, so yeah and actually we do have a markup with a recommendation already because okay. apparently that was in the version 1.1 and i forgot so yeah because um, we were, we were yeah. trying to um speak to uh the um the experts requirements on testing methodology and i believe that those were i believed uh, past tense that they were all captured in three t's but it sounds as though that's not the case yeah, I made some notes of things that were recommended yesterday that okay. didn't get in here too in terms of notification also and yep. um, the um, requirement that testing occurred during, I can't remember the phrase that she used, but during, so, basically during the school year. So yep. yeah, we've got over the a summer. micro grading yeah. tomorrow yeah. at the beginning of our session. So we'll download all of these suggestions to them. We'll also have updated fiscal note from Stephanie and then hopefully starting next week on Tuesday, we'll have every, most everything that we want in the bill, in the bill, and then we'll be kind of vetting with people who want to take another look at it. So you can always come back and get another 10 or 15 minutes. <laughs> so on the, on the technical but very important changes, um, yeah. on your definition of first draw sample, it says to take the sample um, on water that's been standing in plumbing pipes at least six hours. It should actually be between eight and 18 hours. So it's actually, as it I understand the, it, the, the new revision uh, it, it should have eight to 18. There needs to be a stop gap on the back end for a okay. valid um, sample. That's a 3T. That's also reference. Three two line 11. Which number is that one on your, on your sheet? Uh, that is that's not, not on the sheet. Those are picky all. things that you're, you're going to put for little technical so I, things. I, 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 it's I on here. Um, 
a markup of your earlier version. Can but, you leave them? Oh yeah, happy to. Great. Yeah. Let's see now. Um, and then the final thing we just want to make you aware of is um, the appropriation and the governor's appropriation should include um, a, um, money for a staff person, two-year staff person at BDH and two-year staff person at at A and R at DEC. Um, if you are to change the standard down from 15 parts per billion to something lower, or if you are to include child care facilities, that will definitely impact um, our capacity. So for example, there was a discussion of what kind of assistance was, will DEC provide to a school, maybe it would be a child care facility that has a hit. So our folks are available to provide advice um, to, you, know, you can give, you just did the pilot, so what, what's, what's the assistance provided? Uh, the, what DEC's primary role was, was once a TAP is uh, found with elevated levels of lead, we work directly with the school uh, in, in consultation with BDH too. They're not out of um, the process. And really part of it is determining what the next steps are to really diagnose the problem and to understand what type of remediation is going to resolve the issue. So the first initial um, uh, piece is to establish communication with the school, usually it was the head of maintenance, um, and look at uh, additional sampling. We're looking sometimes at water quality. So the pilot were those that were served by public community water systems, so they're receiving municipal water. So part of that is checking the water that's coming into the school, seeing what kind of quality of water the service connection is actually receiving, um, looking at water quality parameters, pH, corrosivity, alkalinity, uh, and really diagnosing the problem and establishing next steps to really figure out what the proper remediation is. Uh, we were um, worried about the worst case scenario in the pilot, which we didn't come across. We, the replacements and the remediations were all relatively straightforward and easy. We saw a lot of bottle fillers going in. We saw a lot of taps being replaced. We didn't get into that nightmare situation where we're chasing the plumbing through the walls and the ceiling. Um, we would anticipate that with the lower standard that there will be more of that happening. Um, it, it is a matter that the simple fixture replacement is not something that we can sort of count on. Um, so am I right, uh, Rebecca, that you said two positions? Today? Right, two positions. So one at BDH and one at DEC. Because, um, and you said with a lower action standard, you might need more. Right, because you'll have more hits. The administration, I believe, has asked in budget adjustments for four positions. So in that case, oh, no, that would be sounds great. And we're all set. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen um, I haven't seen that in budget adjustment for yeah. this initiative. Nine hundred thousand for testing, four hundred thousand for positions, for a number, for a total of one point three. That's what uh, they. So the one point three sounds familiar. Um, but I think the breakdown is a little different from what I have seen. But maybe we should get back to you on that. Some data component. Sure. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so, and again. So maybe the language did the language actually say four positions or just yes. assuming? Yes. Okay. No, and uh, I know because um, of a certain person's reaction to the number. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brian has the or. Or like the, after the pilot testing, they they did the remediation and then there was testing again. Do we, do we still not have those numbers? That's uh, that data was I witnessed like the committee asked for that data yesterday. I contacted BDH today. It's not ready for you today, okay. but we're actively looking at um, the feasibility um, of the one per part per billion based on the limited subset of data we collected in the okay. pilot. So, and I don't mean to be paranoid. Um, but what sometimes happens when you can't get data that seems as though it would be hanging around, because mm -hmm. um, you did the pilot, you have all that data, then it was a, a much smaller subset that you needed to remediate. You did the testing, you have the results. So I'm just wondering why there's a delay getting us those results. Sometimes it would be because it's a bad news story. Um, in, in other words, it, the retesting didn't accomplish everything that it was supposed to do. So I'm all the way of saying that always good to get everything out <laughs> quickly. Yes, we, we will work on getting it out. It, it, it should be available. I'm not the keeper of that data. That is with the health Who's department. The it, health department will have that data. The commissioner yesterday, I think, said he would get it to us. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can I just add to clarify? 
clarifying question in the pilot, what was the PPD standard that you used? Was we, it 15? We went with the existing federal standard, yes, so 15. That it draws consistency um, with the water that's, uh, the standards that the public water suppliers are held to for yeah. the water that's being provided to the school. Um, and in the case of the statewide program, the other bigger consistency issue actually for us would be that 150 of the schools that would be subject to testing under the programs are public water suppliers in, the, in and of themselves mm -hmm. for the non-transient, non-community systems I spoke about yesterday. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, essentially, this would be superseding their the existing standard. And just to, just to um, if I could react to a statement that you had made earlier, uh, it, it is not an old standard. It is the current federal drinking water standard. There's only one other state in the nation that has taken action on a lower drinking water standard for lead um, for public water supply regulations, and that's the state of Michigan. Um, Ooh, why. Following the Flint <laughs> water crisis, and um, their regulation requires uh, the standard to go to 12 parts per billion by uh, 2025. So it's, it's, a, it's a very complex matter, especially when you're talking about large geographical areas. Um, and that shouldn't necessarily be compared to a per tap at school program. They're a little bit different, um, but that's, that's valuable information. Yeah, I don't, I don't see anything wrong with saying, uh, given you know, the testimony we had from the commissioner about developing brains and um, the especially toxic effects on young people, that we might have, even temporarily, a more strict standard in schools than we have in other places in the state. Um, but, but again, 15 would be very difficult to bring to the fore with a straight face given the testimony that we had about the science involved. Um, so again, still an open question, but anything else, folks? That's it, thank you. Any final questions? Great. Thank you so much. That was very helpful. Okay, great. And, and I will pass your suggestions oh. and the ones I marked from Jeff Francis on to uh, Michael Grady. Uh, and I will have another discussion with him about um, Department of Health taking the lead. And um, committee, are you comfortable with me um, asking for a revision <laughs> based on the things that seem to me to make sense from these lists? Or would you prefer to go through point by point and? We can do that after. Can we Let's get it all on one? So we can do a side by side too. Yeah, so maybe let's do it like this. How about if I speak with um, Mike about the things that seem to me to need to go in, and then when we have the new draft, you'll have these documents and your notes on them. If there's anything that didn't make it in, then we can we can have a discussion having to put it in. Um, but I think that's a more efficient way of doing a, a revision, just to get the bulk of it in. Um, unless there's, um, well, you can also at that point strike it out. So, is that? Yeah, I mean, so you're suggest you're saying you would work with Mike to get a, a third draft by tomorrow? Okay. No, not by tomorrow. Oh, okay. So in other words. Michael come in tomorrow, we'll, we'll talk. When the committee breaks, I will sit down with, with him with these documents and um, ask him, I've made some marks on the ones that seem to me uncontroversial or that we seem to be in agreement with. And we can have him put those in. Then we'll have a draft on Tuesday. And at that point, we can, if you notice any one of these that didn't make it into the draft, we can Got note it. it. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, but that's what's I'm fine with that. If that's the case, what will we talk to him about tomorrow? If we're well, not going to go about through. the draft that he's um, that he's producing, actually, we could. All right, let's do it this way. When we talk to him, we'll talk about the draft he did, but then we'll also um, all of us have our notes from today. I'll I'll sort of lead the discussion about things that I think should go in, but we'll all chime in and have not as formal as a straw vote on each one, but just sense of the committee as we go along, and then we'll, we'll drop them to him one by one, he'll make notes, and then we'll send him out with those um, notes for a vision. Does that sound good? So in other words, instead of me doing it with him alone, we'll just do it together. As a committee, yeah, sure. Yeah. It means we'll, we'll take a little more time tomorrow, but 
Yeah, and we don't have a lot on the, on the agenda. So. Are we starting at 1 tomorrow? Is the We're starting on 1 because it's Friday. So the idea is to get everybody out just a little earlier. Yeah, that's it. Oh, oh implicit so, bias training is going to go. So one, implicit one, bias training is going to go one, two hours. So that's that would to be one thirty. So we have implicit bias training at 11.30. And I don't know what our morning committees are doing. And we're we'll going to lunch. <laughs> he, said that we, he said we were so going to eat during the Did these people respond? Yeah, yes. that's what I mean. So how are we all going to fit into this room and eat? And Ethan Allen? Yeah, Ethan Allen. Ethan Allen. Yeah, yeah. Three, you're not all going to eat. Oh. Like standing up. Yeah. <laughs> eat yeah. at 11. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I had asked Jeannie to fill out tomorrow um, not thinking that we would be doing this yeah. with um, Michael. I do have a starting at 1, but you're right, it'll be at least 1.30. Yeah. Well, you so, can take Michael out and just you meet with him, your original proposal. Yeah. We, we don't need to meet with him if you're going to meet with him. And again, I mean, there's... Okay, if you don't mind me doing that, we can take Michael off the um, agenda and start with Stephanie at 1.30. What? Are we making any fiscal changes that she's going to have to come back to us with another note of what we're doing for Michael? So I guess my point no, is... No, I don't think so. So she's going to present us with the options she has so far. That will inform our thinking. We won't have to decide tomorrow. But we can give her any additional revisions or questions. So she's her fiscal note's a work in progress that we're collaborating on, as is the draft with Mike. So we'll have both of them back in on Tuesday with revisions after tomorrow. But I can I can talk with Mike offline, and um, we'll talk together with Stephanie tomorrow um, and get a sense of what her numbers are looking like. So if we start here at 1.30, Jeannie, then um, so Mike won't be, if you can cancel with him, him just tell him that I want to, speak to him when we're done yeah so whenever you know let's say 3 30 um tell him uh, see if we can set up an appointment him and me here at 3 30 and then i i've asked Jeannie to um starting at two to um go back to pre-k and have testimony from some providers some are, are your district, Ruth. Yeah. Um, some are my district. Um, but this is the beginning of a sort of smattering of public and private providers and what they think of S10. So that'll take us from about 2 to 3.30. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not having Michael. Okay. So I think these guys can probably be a half an hour. We might run 10 minutes over, but um, <clears throat> yeah, so we'd be out by 3.30 and then I'll sit with um, Michael Grady for another half an hour. Uh, comments, questions? So, so we will, um, I'll start scheduling next week committee time on this bill for us to flesh out our thoughts and begin making these decisions. Clearly, the administration is interested in not moving from a 15 parts per billion standard. Um, they're very serious about wanting uh, the Department of Health to take the lead and some other some other things. So that does that's not determinative for us, but we're going to have to have a, a good solid discussion about if we don't go with their recommendation, why we're not. So the parts per billion, we've been having that discussion as we go. We haven't talked much about who would take the lead. Um, Michael Grady has an argument about why he drafted it as he did. We'll hear that again. But I, I think there's a lot of value in having the administration on one page about their uh, line of authority. So that's I, I regard that as a kind of authoritative argument that Mike's argument would, would have to be strong enough to overturn. So we'll, we'll hear from him. Tuesday then. And then there's the question of the child care centers too that Absolutely. seems to be a different yeah. question. And there's some other ones that we'll that we'll have to wind up straw voting, but um, 
the other thing, just, just to let you know how I operate, I think some committee chairs are very um, look askance if people try to make a case to individual members on the committee. And so you see people having quiet huddles and private huddles in the hall. I, I tell advocates that if they want to make a case to you to change your mind, feel free. So, you know, there's never any prohibition on you listening to as much or as little of people's arguments as you want, even if it means you're going to change your mind from where I think it is. I, I always appreciate a heads up if your position that you've voiced before has changed. But, um, you know, so I, I said to Rebecca, if her people want to speak to you about the parts per billion question privately and have a back and forth, then by all means. Um, and then when we straw vote, again, it's, um, we, we go with four votes. So um, on some of these, we'll have to have a, a way to break the tie, because we have to have a parts per billion standard. So if we go three and three, we have to figure that out, maybe rounds of voting, successive rounds of voting until somebody changes. Three and a half. Right. <laughs> um, but in order to get something out of the committee, we have to go with a vote of four. So if we deadlock on, on a bill, for instance, and it's 3-3, three, three, the bill doesn't advance out of committee, no matter what I or anybody else would want. So. Okay, thanks, guys. Thanks. See you tomorrow.